Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And I'm glad to be back. I was out for a while and I hope that I can start producing more videos for YouTube. Today we're going to tackle the all ceramic crown preparation for lithium disilicate, in other words for Emacs material, and not for lava and not for zirconia. So we want to keep in mind that we need about two millimeters of occlusal clearance for an Emacs preparation. Anything less than that can lead to a significant amount of flexing of the material and post-operative sensitivity. So let's remember we need to reduce at least 1.5, preferably two millimeters. Axially, we're going to reduce to fit with a 0.6 to 0.8 millimeter fillet or fillet finish line. That may be a new term for you. I'll explain that a little bit later on. We want to pay attention to the contours of this tooth as well because we'll be mimicking those contours in the final preparation. Let's get started. We're going to utilize a 330 carbide burr, which is 1.6 millimeters in length, to establish these little slots along the occlusal. And I'll place three of these across the occlusal from a buccal to lingual direction, and I'll place one along the central groove area. It's nice to use this vertical preparation technique to obtain a very accurate reduction. We don't even need to check the occlusal clearance if we follow this technique carefully. It's important to remember that the burr should be extended into the preparation all the way to the depth of the flutes. And sometimes as you're going up a ridge like this, or perhaps you're, you're not looking at it from the right angle, you may be a little bit shallow. So you'll notice here that that mesial slot is a little more shallow than it should be. So on inspection after making these slots, we'll go back and improve them by making them all at least 1.5, 1.6 millimeters. Alternative techniques like utilizing a diamond burr on its side to do your reduction can work, but this is uh, very convincingly successful for us because it is 1.5 millimeters and we can prove it because we can use a 1.5 millimeter length RGS instrument the tip of that is 1.5 exactly, and we can see that we've got the 1.5 millimeters of occlusal clearance that we're going to need to have for this particular situation. I'm going to use a KS0 diamond, which measures 1 millimeter in diameter. We're going to keep it simple, because I only want to use four burrs for the entire preparation. So we just used the 330 to obtain our occlusal clearance. Now we're going to utilize the KS0 which is one millimeter in diameter, and it's not a tapered burr, it's a straight burr. It's a cylindrical in shape, but the end of the burr is rounded and slightly flat at the same time on the, on the base of it. Uh, this is a fairly coarse diamond. It's uh, got diamond particles that measure 100 microns, so it's not a fine diamond, and it works very efficiently. Obviously, if we're performing this procedure in the oral cavity, we are going to be utilizing copious amounts of water spray. I always find it easier to teach with a dry reduction technique because you can see more as a student or as an observer, and uh, I can also see more as I'm making the video. I did mention that Emacs requires 1.5 to 2 millimeters of thickness on the occlusal. That's if you're in dentin. If you're in enamel and you have this unique opportunity to perform a preparation that is super conservative because maybe you're just adding more tooth structure, like perhaps you're opening up the vertical dimension and you want to add tooth structure in the way of Emacs on top of your existing enamel, then you really don't have to reduce very much at all. And this preparation uh, can be super conservative. In fact, the Emacs can be less than 1.5 millimeters because it's bonded to enamel. 
But that situation doesn't happen very often. Typically, when we're doing an all ceramic crown, we have a significant amount of wear. We have a significant amount of two structure that's been uh, destroyed through caries or existing restorations, and we're going to need to reduce more. It's always a good idea to take a look at your preparation midway through from the buckle view to see how well this reduction is going. And you can see here that we've got the three planes, the A, B, and C planes, uh, being made on this occlusal. This is an RGS-4, which measures 1.5 millimeters in width, and you can see that it wiggles a little bit in here, and that's exactly what we want. We want to have that 1.5 millimeters or more, 2 millimeters, and we can also utilize the instrument from the side like this. Uh, oftentimes it's really difficult to obtain proper lingual reduction, and it's nice if you can check the distance between the marginal ridge and the tooth uh, reduction area. The axial reduction is done in the same way that we do uh, axial reduction on other preparations. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that this burr is not going to provide you with adequate taper. You have to create the taper yourself by tipping your handpiece buccal lingually and mesial distally, depending on where you are in the preparation. You can easily push this burr through the interproximal without damaging the adjacent tooth. But I'm going to do this in two steps. I'm going to go as far as I can interproximally with the KS0 on the lingual side and then mimic the uh, contours of the tooth. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the facial side, once again realizing that this is not just one plane, it's really two planes. You have a gingival plane gingival one-third that serves as a retention ring and then you have a plane that's going to be more tapered as you go up towards the occlusal. But I'm going to go as far as I can interproximally on the buckle and on the lingual before I go interproximal slicing. And for that interproximal slicing technique we're going to pick up a, a skinnier burr for that particular purpose and we'll show you that in just a minute. Take care not to hit the adjacent tooth, which is uh, easy to do if you're not careful. And then go as far as you can interproximally so that you leave just a little area on the mesial and a little area on the distal to remove. And for this, I like to use a needle-shaped burr called an 859-010. And watch the way I take the burr from the gingival aspect and slide it uphill. It's not just being pushed through from the lingual or pushed through from the facial, but we're taking this sort of angled approach, almost like the burr is going up hill or going up some steps. And each time I go back, I get the burr a little bit further gingivally. And this technique has worked really well for removing tooth structure and not hitting the adjacent tooth. Look, nothing there at all, no scratches. So we'll go ahead and do the same technique on the distal. Once again, starting at the base and then working uphill, working uphill. You know, the burr is very wobbly and you have to hold your handpiece really steady to avoid having the burr get away from you. And this is where your finger rest and your chair position are really critical. But you'll notice that it's just gaining traction and gaining a little bit of a, of a notch there so that if the burr becomes a little bit more stable as the tip gets more penetrated into tooth structure. And there's even a little bit of a lip of uh, unprepared tooth structure between the molar and the premolar, which helps protect the molar from being damaged. Just keep pushing the burr gingerly and that little lip will remove and you'll have interproximal slice. We're not worried so much about the finish line shape at this point. We're really mainly concerned about breaking through the interproximal. Okay, great. Now that we have that done, let's switch over to the KS0F. Now this is the same as the KS0, except for two things. Number one, it's a little longer, and number two, it's got a 30 micron grit diamond particle in it. You can recognize this burr really easily because of the red stripe at the shank of the burr. But otherwise, it's the same shape. 
in the same dimensions in terms of width. You want to be really careful not to hit that premolar as you're going through the interproximal. What kind of finish line are we trying to achieve here? Is this a chamfer? Is it a heavy chamfer? Is it a modified chamfer? <laughs> Is it a shoulder? Is it an angled shoulder? Is it a radial shoulder? Or maybe a rounded shoulder? All of these words get thrown around in dentistry with uh, almost a lack of consistency in terms of how people utilize these terminologies. And I'm on a quest to try to standardize the way we use terms when it comes to preparations. And uh, I'm working with a couple of grad students right now and putting out a paper on how we can better understand the proper shapes of these preparations for the different materials that we use today. And remember that we use PFM, we use gold, we use zirconia, we use zirconia core that's got a layer of feldspathic on top of it, and then we use the various forms of lithium visilicate. So let's talk just a little bit. On the left you have a true chamfer. This is actually an angle. It looks like a bevel, doesn't it? And that is a great margin for gold work, but we rarely do those. So typically we do a modified chamfer, which has a rounded internal and a declination angle of about 45 degrees. The margin that we're doing today is a fillet. Also, you could call it a fillet, and it provides a 90 degree shoulder type effect at the end. So this is this perhaps new term for you uh, in the welding industry and in the mechanical engineering industry. The term fillet has been used for probably 150 years and it's a, a very well-known term and it really describes this finish line better than any other term that I can think of. It's absolutely not a shoulder and it is not a chamfer. It's not a heavy chamfer either. Uh, chamfers have declination angles that are significantly steeper than the margin that we're achieving here. So I think this term fillet is a, a really good one to use. So we take a look at it from the occlusal and we look for areas that are maybe uh, bumps or irregularities. A lot of times you end up getting little sharp line angles between the mesial and the facial and between the distal and the facial or lingual and it's a really good idea to uh, smooth those off and get a nice smooth transition. We don't want to have any sharp edges when the preparation is completed. This is an RGS 3 which is one millimeter. You can see that we're less than one millimeter significantly so 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 millimeters is, is a terrific uh, Emax axial reduction. Always take a look at this from the buckle and match your burr to the adjacent tooth so that you can have the right shape when you're finished. And it's going to tip quite a bit. You're going to have sort of a secondary plane when you reduce this from the facial. You'll also have a little secondary plane on the lingual side as well. And that's our fillet finish line right there. kind of use a brush stroke and, and if you have the good fortune to use an electric handpiece you can turn the electric handpiece down to 5000 RPMs to do finish work and I in my practice I use a microscope to finish all my margins and I'll even turn the handpiece down to as little as 500 RPMs so it's really really slow In a preparation like this, it's probably going to take us in practice about 20 minutes. You could do it a little bit faster, I'm sure. Uh, I'm a little on the slow side, but I, I think that the extra effort of making things uh, smooth and consistently uh, uniform in the reduction, are, I think, are, are helpful for the technician. And as I've mentioned before in videos, I do own a dental lab in Burbank, California and uh, get to see a lot of different preparation designs and many of them are fantastic and others are challenging for the technicians to work on and I think that it's a uh, it's a big commitment for dentists to continue to work to get better. Now you're looking at the reduction as it's finished and you can see that uh, we have that fillet margin design 
and uh, the reduction follows the adjacent tooth. Now obviously your finish line could be further close to the tissue level or it could be kept up a little higher. I'd like to keep them higher when I make the video so you can see the margins and see the design a little bit better. And everything should be relatively smooth. So thanks for watching. I'm glad to be back and stay tuned for many more.